TV Rain, Dost, the only Russian independent network. We are not allowed to work in our country anymore. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you. It's a real war. Maybe there are some negotiations about that. There will be very serious consequences. TV Rain Newsroom presents Russia Tomorrow. Hello everyone, this is Tikhon Zitko and this is Russia Tomorrow, a project of TV Rain, the only remaining independent Russian TV station. Shortly after the start of the war, we were forced to leave Russia. We are now broadcasting from Europe, but the mission has not changed. We continue to tell the truth about Russia, the truth about the war the Russian government is waging in Ukraine, and the war the Russian government is waging at home against dissenters. We have decided to start broadcasting in English to let audiences in Europe and the United States know about what is really happening in Russia, the truth that Vladimir Putin is trying to hide. And in today's episode. The Kremlin's gas blackmail. Moscow signals a cold winter for Europe, hoping for the lifting of sanctions. Journalist Safronov is sentenced to 22 years in Moscow. Repression in Russia continues. The new academic year under a blitz in Ukraine and under the pressure of propaganda in Russia. Today is the 197th day of the war that Russian President Vladimir Putin unleashed in Ukraine on February 24th. Vicious battles are taking place primarily in the Kherson and Kharkiv regions, where Ukrainian troops launched a counteroffensive about a week ago, even managing to regain control of several settlements. Very little information comes from the location of the fighting itself, but one thing is clear. Dozens and hundreds of human lives are lost every day of the war. The massacre of civilians, including children, will continue every day as long as the war continues. TV Rain Newsroom presents Russia Tomorrow. The winter will be serious. Russia threatens Europe with a cold winter without Russian gas. This isn't just a video for a song by singer Yulia Visbar. This video, published by the Russian officials, makes the main Russian weapon right now clear – Russian energy resources. A week ago, the Kremlin stopped gas supplies via the Nord Stream pipelines, and now Moscow is visually and with a song making it clear what winter will look like in Europe. Behind the song is a hint – it will be a cold winter if Europe does not agree to Moscow's conditions and does not lift the sanctions imposed as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, now the deputy chairman of the Security Council, has now written about this in almost unambiguous terms several times. Here is what he wrote in April. According to the most recent data from the IMF, Europe will be able to manage without our gas for no more than six months. But in reality, it won't even last a week. He followed up on this 10 days ago. Due to the increase in gas prices to 3,500 euros per thousand cubic meters, I have to increase the forecast price to 5,000 euros by the end of 2022. With warm regards. And there are also direct threats from Russian President Vladimir Putin. Will we make political decisions that violate contracts? Of course, we'll simply ignore them. And we won't supply anything at all. No gas, no oil, no coal, no fuel oil. We won't provide anything. And then we'll only have one thing left to say. Shiver away, everyone. Europe's dependence on Russian gas is one of the most confounding contradictions to have emerged from the war in Ukraine. European countries supply weapons to Ukraine and impose sanctions against the Kremlin, but continue to pay Russia for energy. Despite Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's call for the EU to abandon Russian gas or 
at least limit the price is bought for, this has turned out to be an impossible task even for Germany. And just this Tuesday, the French President Macron said that the European Union has gone from getting around 50% of its gas from Russia to 9%. And during the six months that the war has been taking place, the countries of the EU have paid Moscow almost 90 billion euros for fuel, with most of that being gas. As a result, it is not difficult for the Kremlin to threaten Europe with tightening supplies and a cold winter. The narrative seems to have been successful. Rallies against the increase in gas price have already begun in several European cities. The largest one took place when 70,000 people gathered for a demonstration in Prague this weekend. Can Moscow's gas gambit convince Europe to reduce its support of Ukraine and soften its policy towards the Kremlin? Or is there an option to refuse Russian gas? We ask Anastasia Shapochkina, president of Eastern Circle's geoeconomics think tank, lecturer in Sciences Po University of Paris. So, Anastasia, thank you so much for joining us. And the first question is uh, very simple, though maybe the answer is not that simple. But do you think it could be possible that the European, uh, European Union would change its policies on Ukraine and Russia in exchange of warm winter? I think that the European Union has been preparing for this winter at different speeds and with various success. But um, the experience of the last eight years and of sanctions during the last eight years has shown that, um, that the Europe is not imposing sanctions in order to then cancel them in the next two weeks. And the experience, especially of the last six months, has shown that slowly but steadily, every European country, including such optimists as Germany even, got to understand that instead of Russia suffering from European sanctions, much short term, it's going to be the other way around. It's going to be Russia who's going to actually have control over uh, the uh, well-being of the European citizens and its industry longevity in the short run, very short run maybe, uh, but nevertheless. And with that realization, I'd say, especially by May, June, uh, we have seen progress uh, through the uh, new reorientation of its policies by the European Commission and also um, the adjustment of its policies say, within the Repower EU, which called, among other things, for example, to lower energy consumption by 15 percent. And that's going to be, that's an indicator. So countries will have to show for that. I'm sorry, let me interrupt you just to, just to make it clear. Uh, does it mean that the narrative of uh, Russian government and the narrative of uh, Russian state propaganda that e Europe is absolutely on the hook of Russian gas, does it mean that this narrative is uh, false or at least uh, exaggerated? It just maybe shows that um, the propaganda hasn't followed uh, the you know, events of the last of the last few months. Of course, Europe is extraordinarily dependent on Russian gas, and some very big, very important, most important countries of Europe, such as Germany, for example, are especially dependent. But let's look at the numbers. And uh, when we look at the Germany uh, primary energy consumption, uh, we see that thirty percent. Uh, of that uh, is dependent uh, was dependent on uh, is dependent on natural gas, mm -hmm. okay? and uh, of all of the natural gas consumption, fifty five percent used to come from Russia alone in the beginning of the year. Now we are in September, and that number has changed to thirty percent. So now we are looking pretty much at uh, what ten percent of Germany's primary energy consumption dependent on Russia. And within that in mind, now add to this equation the requirement of the European Commission, which in its wisdom has imposed on the national states 15% of the primary energy consumption to come through energy savings, so not consuming. How do you uh, explain these uh, rallies that we've seen uh, uh, over the last days uh, in Czech Republic, for example, or somewhere in Germany? Uh, does it mean that uh, 
not everyone understands that uh, uh, Europe is not as dependent on Russian gas as it used to be, uh, for example, a couple of months ago? Or does people uh, fear that the winter will be cold and they don't have uh, enough information? How would you explain these, these movements? I think it's not just about the winter. We really have to, of course, the, the, the consumer feels not the cold of the winter. The consumer feels the pressure of the inflation. And for that, it doesn't need to wait for it to be cold, for him to turn. Right now, we are in the summer. It's, it's very warm uh, in many places. Uh, nobody is turning on the heating, and yet the rally is already there. And the reason for that is the inflation and the very high prices, of course, for every single energy um, type, including, for example, gasoline. And of course, that can and will lead to protests. In France, uh, if, if we remember the protests of the Yellow Vest, they started with the high gasoline prices. In Bulgaria, we had government, a government displaced because of high electricity prices. And uh, of course, there are going to be protests and people are feeling the pressure on their wallets. And uh, in the short run, we may see also a slowing down of the industry uh, production capacity, and in the, which can very quickly, not in such a very long run, but rather quickly result in industry moving somewhere else. And this has also been already experienced by the European Union. There are risks, and I'm not saying this is going to be amazing, but I just want to say that I do not expect these risks to be so... Um, I do not expect the changes to be so high, and I may be wrong, right? We may just see each other two months from now or one month from now, and everything will just be the opposite of what I'm just saying. But uh, I think that uh, it's not going to be dramatic enough, the situation, given the preparation that's ongoing right now across the European Union, for the European Union to just cancel all the sanctions on Russia. That I do not see coming. All right. Let's meet here in a in a couple of months, and we'll see how how it um, how it goes. Anastasia Shapichkin, president of uh, Eastern Circles uh, Geoeconomics Think Tank, lecturer in Science Po University of Paris. Anastasia, thank you so much. Thank you. Russia tomorrow. Repression continues in Russia. On Monday, a court in Moscow sentenced journalist Ivan Safronov to 22 years in a penal colony. Yes, that's right. The journalist was sent to prison for 22 years. Safronov was accused of high treason even though the investigation did not find any evidence and the journalist did not have access to classified information. Friends and colleagues of Safrono therefore believe that the Russian authorities are taking revenge on him for his article about the supply of Russian fighter jets to Egypt, as the Kremlin had tried to hide information about this deal. Dozens of people came to court to support Safronov. I cannot call this verdict anything but pathetic. I could repeat the same tired things about its illegitimacy and ill-foundedness, but it's hard to explain the level of absurdity we have borne witness to today. Ivan Safronov has been sentenced to 22 years for his journalistic practice. I would like all of you looking at me now to think about whether it's worth staying in this profession if a person was given 22 years for doing his job. On the same day, a different court in Moscow revoked the license of one of the last independent media outlets, Novaya Gazeta, under vague bureaucratic reasons. They were set the task of destroying Novaya Gazeta, so they kept searching and searching for something, and when they didn't find it, they just went and made it up. The shamelessness of the whole situation is another issue altogether, but we didn't expect a different outcome. We are ready for it, and this verdict will not impact the activities of Novaya Gazeta journalists going forward. We have work to do. For that, we will use various different platforms that we've already created, as well as others that we're going to create in the future. The head and co-founder of Novaya Gazeta is Dmitry Muratov. As early as in winter, in his Nobel Peace Prize lecture, he condemned the promotion and normalization of war. 
The dictatorships have secured access to violence. In my country, and not only there, it is common to think that politicians who avoid bloodshed are weak, while threatening the world with war is the duty of true patriots. The powerful actively promote the idea of war. Aggressive marketing of war affects people, and they start thinking that war is acceptable. Governments and their propaganda supporters are fully responsible for the militaristic rhetoric on state-owned television channels. But there are other TV screens that show honest and gruesome pictures. I have seen them. And on Saturday, Dmitry Muratov led the procession at the funeral of another founder of Nova Gazeta and another Nobel laureate, Mikhail Gorbachev. The last leader of the Soviet Union passed away on Wednesday in Moscow. Thousands of people came to bid him farewell. Many Russians associate freedom with the name of Mikhail Gorbachev, and he gave the world two famous Russian words, perestroika and glasnost. Now, many Russians say that President Putin has left Gorbachev's legacy in ruins. Many people are here because Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev is a great historical figure who I hope will be appreciated and venerated by our descendants. He is someone who gave my generation an opportunity to live, to live a free and interesting life, and someone who dreamed that the 21st century might be the century of humanity and justice. And sadly, I think it will have been very difficult for him to observe what is happening now in the final years of his life. I think now we might even need not just one Gorbachev to change the course of what's happening. For the first time in Russian history, he abolished the practice of using violence on your own population. For me, he's a great human being who literally saved the world from nuclear catastrophe and who entered the Cold War. Unfortunately, we seem to have neglected all of this, so I think that it is very important to pay tribute to the memory of Mikhail Sergeyevich and to try to follow his path of democracy and freedom in the future. Repression in Russia intensified as the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine began. During the six months of the war, more than 5,000 websites were blocked, including the most popular media sources and largest social networks like Twitter and Facebook. Dozens of independent media outlets have been shut down and hundreds of journalists have left the country. More than 16,000 people have been detained for their anti-war positions and more than 200 criminal cases have been opened, in particular the politicians Vladimir Karamurza and Ilya Yashin were arrested and now face up to 10 years in prison. Last week, politician Leonid Gozman was arrested for 15 days. Here is what he said on our broadcast a few weeks before that. He is counting on the fall of the Western world. He, of course, has no desire for a multipolar world. He wants a world in which Russia is the dominant power. For now, he talks about a multipolar world because, right now, Russia cannot be the most dominant. It's the position of a loser, really. Yekaterina was saying that we are a European power, but now we are friendly, or trying to be, with Erdogan, with Iran, with China, with Venezuela, with whoever and anyone who we only share negative characteristics with, a shared sense of hatred and a feeling of losing out. He began this special military operation clearly assuming that the Ukrainians would not resist, that they would surrender by the thousands, that Kiev would be captured in 96 hours, but none of this worked out at all. And this drives him absolutely mad. Russia tomorrow. Yet another conviction against the opponents of Alexander Lukashenko was passed in Belarus. The court sentenced the three activists to terms of 10 to 11 years in prison. They were accused of plotting to assassinate the current leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, and subsequently seize power. The best known of the three is the political scientist Alexander Fiduta. Last spring, he was kidnapped by members of the Belarusian Special Services in Moscow and taken to Minsk. Fiduta has become the latest opponent of Alexander Lukashenko, sentenced to a long prison term after the failed revolution in Belarus in 2020. After the presidential election results were falsified, hundreds of thousands of Belarusians took to the streets 
protesting, but they were brutally cracked down on, with more than 11,000 criminal cases opened against the participants. The EU member countries and the United States imposed sanctions against the regime of Alexander Lukashenko, and he came under an even greater degree of influence from Moscow. The Kremlin specifically used the territory of Belarus to launch strikes on Ukraine. Now we have a Katia Glott, fellow with the Center for European Policy Analysis on the air. Katia, great to be here with you. Thanks for joining us. Yes, hello, Tiffan. Thanks very much for having me. So I'm, I'm wondering, how would you explain such, I would say, cruelty up to 11 years in jail? Lukashenko's position seems pretty strong in Belarus, or at least he pretends to be strong. Why would he punish his opponents so hard? Yes, that's a very good question. I think there are two reasons. The first reason is very personal. We know that Alexander Fiduta, a long time ago, back in 1995, when Lukashenko was first elected as the president of Belarus, he was in his team. And then Fiduta defected, and he has been in the opposition for the remaining um, 25 years, I think. And we know that Lukashenko is very, very revengeful. So he always wants to to punish his opponents. Well, this is first, this is the personal reason. But unfortunately, um, politically, it's nothing new. This very harsh sentence, it really falls in line with what we have seen in Belarus um, since um, August 2020. And the crackdown has particularly intensified since the start of Putin's war in Ukraine. Um, you mentioned that there have been 11,000 cases, criminal cases opened in Belarus. Um, we know that over 800 NGOs have been closed down. Um, some of them closed down, uh, shut down themselves because they could not function. Yeah. And we're seeing really very harsh sentences being handed down to journalists. Um, for example, Katerina <laughs> Andre, a journalist who was supposed to come out this September. She received another 11 years in prison for uh, completely trumped up charges of state treason. And several days after Mr. Fiduta got his sentence, um, a young woman called Marfa Rapkova. She's a very famous human rights defender mm -hmm. in Belarus. Um, she received 15 years in 15 prison. 15 years. And Yes, 15 years. Um, so I think what we're seeing here is really that, well, the authorities are really trying to continue to crack down on civil society. I think Lukashenko has really um, come to the realization that he's not popular anymore. If you can argue that um, a year ago, he was still hoping that these, you know, th that was a small part of the population mm -hmm. of Belarus who supported the protest. But I think by now, and uh, particularly with the start and the ongoing war in Ukraine, I think Lukashenko really realized that he lost the support um, of, uh, of the public in Belarus. So for him, the only reason the only way to stay in power is actually to um, put in jail his opponents to intimidate um, uh, the public more and perhaps to show that even if he if even if he steps down himself in 15 years we might expect you know his successor yeah. someone who will be very similar so I think unfortunately so you can come in back and summarizing um, oh, yeah. your question um, the answer to your question I think it's nothing new and this really um, is the trend that we are seeing currently in Belarus. Speaking of this uh, ongoing war uh, in uh, Ukraine, we know that over the years, Lukashenko, he has been trying to find a balance between Moscow and the West, between Moscow and the European Union or uh, the United States. After he cracked down on the uh, protests in 2020, Kremlin supported him. Uh, maybe that's why he survived. Uh, so Kremlin supported him and he had no choice but to become Moscow's satellites. Now we know that Russia is using uh, territory of Belarus to attack Ukraine. Do you think it's possible that uh, one day, sooner or later, Belarus become, becomes an actual part in this war? 
Well, I think anything is possible. Of course, we should not rule this out. I think Lukashenko is doing what he can to prevent this scenario for several reasons. Well, first of all, the war is very unpopular in Belarusian society. And this is, I think, where Belarusian public is different from um, the one in Russia, according to the latest polls. And again, of course, you can argue that there are no free Absolutely. polls in an authoritarian <laughs> would, country. Yeah. But yeah, but 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 nonetheless, I mean, those which are conducted over the internet, they show that about two thirds of the Belarusian public do not support the war in Ukraine, and I think the same is happening within the regime itself. Mm -hmm. So obviously, Lukashenko understands that if he gets further dragged into this war, that might um, result in very unexpected circumstances in Belarus. It might be even um, people within his own regime trying to. Um, take against him, it might um, reignite the protest. So, so far, he has been able to resist. But we don't truly really know to what extent he will be able to continue that. I think that it's really so far Putin himself who probably thinks that Belarus is not really a value added, but more mm -hmm. a vulnerability um, and a liability to Russia, because we know that the Belarusian army is quite weak. It does not have any combat experience. It's not big in numbers. It's about 30,000 people. And uh, it's not really something that where the army, Belarusian army could help. It would be more, um, maybe more or even a distraction. But whatever is useful to uh, Putin, he's trying to use. And that is, you know, as you rightly said, that the territory of Belarus is being used. We are hearing constantly about different strikes. There is some information about um, uh, different reconnaissance exercises happening um, from Belarus. There is no confirmation to that. But probably they are happening. So mm -hmm. whatever um, comes next, I think if Putin decides at some point, particularly if Ukraine becomes successful with its um, counter offensive against Russia, and um, Putin decides that he needs more manpower and I think he will easily tell Lukashenko that, yes, send your army. And Lukashenko will have no way to escape that. So he will have to send Belarusian troops. Well, let's hope we will avoid this uh, scenario. Thank you so much, Katya Glot. Uh, thank you for your time and for your expertise. TV Rain Newsroom presents Russia Tomorrow. Under these circumstances, the bordering countries of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia announced that they would restrict the entry of Russian and Belarusian citizens from September 15th. They will not let in Russians and Belarusians with Schengen visas, with some rare exceptions. This decision has been made for a number of reasons. Firstly, citizens of the aggressor nation and its ally should not be able to holiday in Europe during the war. Secondly, humanitarian visas are not suspended, so those under the threat of persecution are still able to leave. There are also some in Europe who believe that those who are dissatisfied with the government should not leave Russia, but should instead stay put and work toward a regime change. The countries of Eastern Europe, the Baltic states and Poland are the most radical in the sense. As a result, they propose a complete ban on the issuance of Schengen short-term visas to Russians. The European Union, however, does not support the idea of a complete ban, and Washington does not agree with this approach either. Here is what John Kirby of the National Security Council told TV Ray. We don't believe that this is a time for business as usual with Russia. We have instituted uh, visa bans on certain Russian individuals. We believe that that is a tool in the toolbox to hold Mr. Putin accountable uh, for what he's doing in Ukraine uh, and to specifically hold accountable uh, those members of his uh, 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 oligarchy, uh, his, his regime uh, that are involved specifically uh, in the, the war in Ukraine. But we don't believe it's productive uh, to hold all the Russian people accountable for what Mr. Putin is doing. Uh, we don't believe that this should be a, uh, a war against the Russian people. The Russian people are not to blame here. It is President Putin uh, and his cabinet and his regime uh, that is propagating this illegal and unprovoked war in Ukraine. And the Russian people themselves should not have to suffer as a result.
Opponents of the total visa ban argue that this decision would be counterproductive and would only help Russian propaganda talk about Russophobia in the West. It also holds all Russians, including those fighting against the current regime, accountable for the actions of Vladimir Putin. Is this really fair? For more on this, here is my colleague Mikhail Fishman. The European Union hasn't banned Russian tourists from entering Europe. Instead, EU countries decided to suspend a visa facilitation accord with Russia, making it more difficult for Russians to get to Europe as tourists. This decision was immediately criticized in Kyiv as a half measure. EU countries bordering Russia already announced they would impose additional restrictions on Russian nationals. This fierce debate inside Europe and the subsequent compromise reflect the fact that as Putin's unprovoked and brutal war with Ukraine drags on, Russians are increasingly seen as responsible for it, and they must pay the price. As Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has put it, Russians should live in their own world until they change their philosophy. It's hard not to understand this approach. According to various polls, on average, three quarters of Russians continue to support what the Kremlin calls a special military operation, Less than 20% oppose it. Putin's approval rating has also gone up since early March. From previous experience, Putin already knows that small military victories would always help him to improve his image across Russia. His approval rating skyrocketed after Russia's military invaded parts of Georgia in August 2008. In March 2014, after the annexation of Crimea, his approval jumped 20% in just two weeks, creating a social phenomenon that political experts came to call the Crimea Consensus. And it would be a mistake to attribute this outcome exclusively to the effect of ubiquitous official propaganda, argues Alexei Levinson, an expert at the Levada Center Independent Pollster. Propaganda can go a very long way, but it isn't everything. It only forms and articulates the ideas that crystallize in the mass consciousness as a result of its internal factors and the influence of the external environment. These mass representations were not just formed today and not just in the recent past. Yet support for the war across Russian society is far from universal. According to one of the latest polls, while 60% would support Putin's decision to advance on Kyiv, 65% would be happy if he stopped the war and made peace with Ukraine. If anything, these findings, however self-contradictory they may seem, demonstrate that Putin's war is not massively backed by Russians. The hawkish, war-mongering sector of Russian society is rather narrow. The majority finds the easiest way out is to adapt to a situation it can't affect and to shift responsibility to the government. Adapting has always been a key tenet of social life in Russia, but now the situation is very different people are adapting to horrible circumstances as their government destroys a neighboring country. It's true, though, that the specter of empire has been haunting Russia for many decades, if not centuries. Putin did not bring this to the Russians. He rather made it a cornerstone of his own political standing. His predecessor, Boris Yeltsin, started his rule as the overthrower of the Soviet Union. In the early 90s, as his biographer Timothy Colton recalls, he was animated by a desire not to inspire Russian empire with a new life, but to instead build a civilized modern state. For Yeltsin, another point, as I see it, was determinative. He opted against the neo-USSR because he was opting for a Russian state, self-standing, governable, and capable of modernization and normalization. To put it another way, he opted for nation building over empire saving. However, when Yeltsin's government started moving in this direction and launched ambitious economic reforms, the harsh socio-economic context almost immediately triggered this great power syndrome. And by the end of 1993, Yeltsin, as a leader, was surrounded by all kinds of populists grieving for Russia's past greatness. He succumbed, in part, to this pressure. His war in Chechnya was seen as a political response to imperial demand. And during his second presidential term, his line pivoted toward Soviet patterns and policies of the past. 
yet he rather quickly admitted his mistakes in Chechnya. And it's impossible to imagine Yeltsin starting a major war with a neighboring country such as Ukraine. It's enough to say that in 1994, he signed the Budapest Memorandum, which guaranteed the integrity of Ukraine's borders in exchange for Kyiv giving up its nuclear arsenal. And in 1997, he signed a friendship treaty between Russia and Ukraine, in which both sides committed to respecting each other's borders and territorial integrity. There is a reason why, being increasingly haunted by the nation's growing nostalgia, Yeltsin still never followed it to its logical end. Wars of conquest and aggression fear loud opposing voices. They become ugly, disastrous, and needless when put in the spotlight by free media and political opposition. In the mid-90s, Yeltsin was unable to present his defeat in Chechnya, both moral and on the battlefield, as a victory, something that Putin is seemingly still able to achieve after his presumed blitzkrieg in Ukraine turned into a bloody stalemate with no end in sight. If Russia were a democracy, it would make sense to blame Russians for all the suffering their government has brought down on the Ukrainian people and for the fear it inspires in Europe. But Russia is a tyranny. Acceptance of Putin's war is shaped not only by massive propaganda, which resonates with the national sentiment and desire for recognition of the country's status as a great power, but also by repressions on a scale not seen even in late Soviet times. Activists and dissidents are jailed. All protesting voices are silenced. Opposition is destroyed. For more than the last 15 years, elections are rigged to create an illusion of unanimous support for Putin's ambition. As a result, Russians know they have no real choice other than to adapt to the new reality. Great power syndrome exists in Russia. It's a dangerous social emotion. It makes bloody conflicts possible. But it's oppression, despotism, and indefinite personal rule that make them inevitable, taking a nation hostage. TV Rain Newsroom presents Russia Tomorrow. A new academic year has begun in Russia. For the Russian authorities, the school has become a separate ideological front. The volume of patriotic education will be increased in all educational institutions. Important conversations is the name of a new lesson for school children to be held once a month. Explanations to school children for why Russia invaded Ukraine began from just about the first days of the war, acting as a sort of preventative on-the-ground influencing campaign. The Ukrainian government, as far back as 2016, were preparing an assault to bomb and destroy Donbass, and then to attack Russia itself. As early as March, children were encouraged to write letters to the front. I want to say thank you very much for protecting our country, Russia. For the mother of a 10-year-old girl, the refusal to write such a letter soon forced her out of the country. Diana from Kirov now finds herself in Germany with her child. The volunteer Sergei Pinyagin helps Russian teachers to obtain political asylum. It was Sergei who told us about Diana's story, as she herself is currently too afraid to speak openly about what happened. Towards the end of May, she was summoned to the principal's office. There was also someone else there, a large man listening quietly in the corner. The principal began talking about the refusal to write a letter, emphasizing the importance of military education, saying that the kids should be on the front line helping and supporting the effort, and that they should be educating future patriots. At that point, the large, previously silent man, who would never introduced himself, confiscates her phone, makes her unlock it, explaining that if she, as a mother, cannot raise her daughter as a patriot, the government is forced to do it instead. The message was clear. Hi everyone, I'm here to bring you some letters. At some point in June, when the holidays began, she left with her daughter to see their grandparents in the countryside. Soon after, her neighbors called, saying that somebody was looking for her. First, a local police officer had come by, and then some workers from an adoption agency came over to check on her daughter's living conditions. 
In another month, Diana was summoned to appear as a suspect. From the documents, it is, however, somewhat unclear what exactly she was suspected of. Now here we've got some paper airplanes with a message. Both parents and teachers have been hounded for holding anti-war stances. While some teachers lost their jobs, others, instructed by orders from above, arranged patriotic lessons and visits from those who had already fought in Ukraine for the children. They showed photos and videos. They lined up the students in the shape of the letter Z. From the start of this academic year, it will be especially impossible to get away from this patriotic education. This is how each Monday will begin in every Russian school. And once a month, also on a Monday, a special lesson will be held to discuss important issues. The Ministry of Education described in detail the topic scenarios and special video clips planned for each lesson. This first special discussion will take place on September 5th and will be dedicated to the Day of Knowledge. Most of all, teachers and parents were concerned about the upcoming topic of our country, Russia. More precisely, not exactly the topic itself, but the content that was to be discussed. The feeling of patriotism and the responsibility for the fate of the motherland has always inherently been present in the Russian person. The Ministry of Education presents the special military operation as a perfect representation of Russian patriotism. Children will be told about NATO bases and that it is, in fact, the West collectively that is to blame for the mass casualties in Ukraine. It is separately proposed to discuss the exploits of Russian soldiers, but not those that were in Bucha or Irpen. Maybe this was the initiative of our principal especially, but she did say that she would be monitoring the lessons which will be happening at the same time across the entire school, making sure to listen to what we are discussing with the children and how appropriately we are conveying the information. The topics are planned out until the end of the year, including a day celebrating teachers, the birthday of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, and naturally the topic of traditional family values. In the lesson, it is specifically emphasized that a family is when a woman marries a man and they have children. As designed by the Ministry of Education, this lesson should mold real Russian patriots. Naturally, heated discussions began in parental group chats and forums on what effect this might have on the children's psyche and how this might affect their autonomy. Glory to the Soviet Army! The army is victorious! Glory to the Soviet people! The Soviet people are victorious! Who are your grandfathers? Our grandfathers are the victors! Whose grandchildren are you? We are the grandchildren of the victors! What is the cross? The cross is a weapon and symbol against sin and death. What is fear? When there is no love. What is envy? When there is no love. What is love? Love is sacrifice. We were also told today that after six months of this regime, there will be a review of how capably these teachers are conveying the information to the students. After that, a decision will be made. Either we will continue teaching the same lessons for six months, or the duty will be passed on to other teachers. In the official Telegram channel titled Important Discussions, there are detailed instructions provided on what to do if students miss these important lessons. Marina from St. Petersburg went into school to discuss a possible new or different lesson. I asked the question, is there any legal possibility of not attending these lessons? Can I write some sort of note or testify that it goes against my principles? In response, I was told that they were not interested in my principles, just like that. I was then told, in quite forceful terms, that this is a public government school with a particular set of standards handed down to them, which they have to follow and all of that. That was it. Yet still, teachers and psychologists are telling parents to go to schools, talk to teachers and look for a way out or at least a workaround together, and most importantly, to keep talking to their kids.
The academic year has begun in Ukraine as well, but only for half of the schools. If in Russia, school children find themselves under ideological pressure, then in Ukraine it is not safe for them to attend school at all. More than 2,000 schools suffered from military strikes during the six months of the war. It's complete barbarism, for which there's no reasonable explanation. Putin seems like a schizophrenic or something like that. A psychiatrist would know better than me. But this conduct barely qualifies as a war. It is a complete extermination of a people. Well, look, about two and a half thousand schools in Ukraine have been damaged, 284 of them being destroyed completely. What's more, this is being done intentionally. They believe, or they want those consuming their media sources to think they believe, that there are troops stationed in those schools. There are no troops stationed in those schools at all. 284 schools in Ukraine have been turned into rubble, and these children have nowhere to study at all. In general, this is the extermination of an entire people. All Ukrainians understand this very well. But this is the madness of Putin. People like that you have to remove and separate from society. In the new academic year, Ukrainian children, in addition to their regular backpacks with uh, textbooks and notebooks, will have to carry a second backpack in case of an air raid. This should contain a bottle of clean water, energy bars and nutritious snacks, a favorite toy or personal memento, and a change of underwear and clothes. Children are the most helpless victims of this war. In the past six months, at least 382 children were killed in Ukraine, with uh, 236 still missing. This is Russia Tomorrow from the TV Rain. Make sure to share this video on social media and among your friends and support our work using the link in the description. I'm Tikhan Zitko. I will see you soon.